From now on, you do exactly as I say. When you talk about Boris Karloff, when you talk about his great role, you think Frankenstein, Fu Manchu, Body Snatcher, but if you talk about Boris Karloff as a character, you think of the storyteller. She hate me. Karloff was able to lure them inside and to see things looking out. I'm sure Karloff never thought that it was going to lead to an entire career starring in horror movies. I am ready. Black and white they may be, but even that's part of the appeal. I've yet to find a way of combining Frankenstein's technique with my own. There's a strange mysticism about Karloff, almost, you could say, a spirituality. Uh, women responded to it, children responded to it, animals responded to it. They loved Boris Karloff. There was something very, very odd about him. It was almost like the St. Francis Assisi of horror stars. There was always that underlying uh, touch that he brought to it that made you feel sorry for the characters he played. Boris Karloff brought a quality to the horror film that hadn't been seen since the death of Lon Chaney. And it's not a quality that you would immediately associate with a horror icon. What it is is vulnerability. He was able to kind of explore these characters from very unexpected areas and really surprise the audience. You shall rest from that, like the setting sun in the west. But you shall dawn anew in the east as the first rays of Amon-Ra dispel the shadows. If anybody ever paid their dues in the acting profession, it was Boris Karloff. He cleared land, he drove trucks, he did hard labor to make a living so that he could act. Because he was a good actor, he was able to, I think, take advantage of the, um, the opportunities that came by, and it, and it didn't hurt that he had good directors. It's very obvious to most of us nowadays that a horror icon is someone, one who has outlived the films or outli outlived their own life in these films and gone on to inspire a new generation. Even when he was being gentlemanly or subtle, you got the impression there was this great storm raging in this man behind those incredible eyes. There's a feral quality in Karloff. There's never anything comforting or cozy about the performances. The horror films that he was in almost transcend the genre. These people can survive that long. They are genuine, genuine movie stars and movie icons. When Universal clicked with Dracula, instantly they knew that it wasn't going to be Jekyll and Hyde next, it was going to be Frankenstein next. Partly that was economics. Universal said, hey, we've made a lot of money out of this, let's do something else. What's the other famous book? It's Frankenstein. These monsters represent, embody something in the moviegoers' psyche at the time. We could probably make a case that Frankenstein is, is the first film to be made where someone has deliberately set out to make a horror film. Boris Karloff is in two early Howard Hawks pictures. He's in The Criminal Code, in which he plays a homicidal prisoner, and he's very impressive and scary in it. There's a scene where he goes to stalk a brutal warder and to kill him, and he moves in a very, very strange, interesting way. He won't get any bigger. Take him before he finds out about these guns. And, of course, he's in Scarface, as one of the um, gangsters that has double-crossed Scarface and gets rubbed out while he's bowling. <laughs> Carl Emley Jr. was determined to make Frankenstein, and so he looked around on the lot for a director, and James Whale was directing Waterloo Bridge. Carl Emley Jr. had watched the dailies, which were quite impressive, and um, he offered the assignment to James Whale. And James Whale saw the dramatic possibilities and jumped at it. Whale didn't think that the same guy should play Dracula and Frankenstein. He thought that that would confuse the public. Lugosi was unceremonially dumped from Frankenstein rather than stepping aside to make way for, for Karloff. Karloff always said, uh, he, uh, he's asked Whale, well, what do you want me to test for? And Whale said, a damned awful monster. And Karloff said his feelings were hurt because he was rather well-dressed and made up that day for a role in a gangster picture, and he said, I thought I looked rather saucy. James Whale saw the monster having a sort of bony skull-like face on top of a big body. The only thing that was missing was the large body, but of course that could be padded in a costume. And of course on the titles, he's a question mark. Karloff has no billing. It's like, who is the monster? Karloff's sense of menace was there, just waiting to happen. The 
combination of two Englishmen in Hollywood, and in the case of James Well, clearly somebody who felt kind of committed to the outsider. <laughs> It's one of those things that, you know, every so often everything falls together perfectly, and in the case of Frankenstein with Carl as the monster, by gum it did. I think it's one of the greatest performances in cinema. It's one of the most moving, wordless performances that we have. I think what's so touching about the creature in Frankenstein is it's a silent film performance in a sound movie. He's doing all these wonderful pantomime gestures, and you feel incredibly sort of sympathetic towards him, uh, as if he's a sort of recalcitrant child. It's not his fault. I mean, he didn't, you know, he didn't choose to have dysfunctional brain put into his cranium. I mean, that was Fritz's fault. Did I ask for this? It's not my fault. You know, why have you done this to me? Karloff was brilliant at why have you done this to me. The moment when we see him first in Frankenstein, of course, is one of the hugely great things. Bam, bam, bam. His jump cuts into his face before Goddard or Truffaut or New Wave. Even though it's wildly different makeup, he's still recognizably Karloff beneath it. And it gives him the ability to be very subtly expressive. Sit down. Sit down that really does fix him in that image. And it's a masterclass in acting anyway, uh, but it's also a masterclass in how Hollywood creates myths in the 20th century. Well, Karloff looks like the perfect Frankenstein monster. It's one of those classic matches of, of role, and in this case, obviously, makeup uh, and commitment to, to the part. But there's a sense in which old Karloff's squarish head was, was perfect for what Jack Pierce wanted to do with it. And there's that wonderful scene where the monster reaches up to the light, and you can almost imagine watching that scene that Karloff is asking God to give him a soul. Take care, Herr Frankenstein, take care. And based on his performance, you almost believe that he's been given one. It's like this miracle happens in the film. I think that audiences, without necessarily articulating that, felt it. People also tend to forget that the monster is terrified all the time. It's one of the great cinematic representations of fear and terror. Sit down. Go and sit down. Karloff brought those memorable gestures, the, the, the upside down hand gesture of supplication and asking for some kind of understanding in this world. The humanity in those eyes behind those heavy lids. And the heavy lids, by the way, was also Karloff's addition to the makeup. He said, the monster looks too aware. I think this monster should be almost sleepwalking. We, we need to show him not quite dead and not quite alive, and thus came up with the heavy waxed eyelids. He goes through huge ranges of emotion just in the eyes, and I think that's again what Whale recognized, that, that he could do that. And it's a very unusual gift to be able to understand the camera and know what you can do. The merest flicker, which is imperceptible perhaps to the naked eye, the camera picks it up. <laughs> The easy out of playing that part is just to play it for sympathy. If he had played it all as the, the monster on the loose, the horror elements of it, that wouldn't have worked as well. As, a, as an experienced stage actor, he brought those two elements together and, and he melded them into, into one single dramatic performance. Karloff realises that, you know, if, if you whip a dog, it turns vicious. Oh, come away, Fritz. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. What's the scariest thing in, in the film is the way that you see how this potentially noble, innocent figure is, through mischance and abuse, turned into a monster. Would you like one of my flowers? The most remarkable scene that I always think of with Karloff is the scene with little Maria and the incredible tragedy that he's able to create with that little girl, with Marilyn Harris in that scene. The, the twisted smile he has, the strange falsetto laughter he has while they play. I mean, this is a very eerie scene, incredibly powerful. No, you're hurting me! No! 
He's using every atom of his ability. And I think Karloff, although he came from a very well-to-do background, was coming into Frankenstein after a, several decades of basically very poor living. I think that really gives the, the Frankenstein monster a sort of underclass feel. Mary Shelley's monster never shuts up. What the makers of the film decide is to silence the monster entirely, which allows Karloff license under this extraordinary half a ton of makeup, padding a big monster suit to produce this extraordinarily moving, kind of balletic mime. These movies superseded the literary sources and became something else. They became a myth. This would generate this, this remarkable folklore in Hollywood. How do you evoke this nightmarish creature such as Frankenstein's monster pieced together from corpses, bolts in his neck, terribly frightening creation. And how do you actually get audiences to love the character? And so it was a remarkable achievement both for Whale as a director, for Karloff as an actor, to be able to pull that off. The creature is, is the center, the heartbeat of that movie. If Karloff hadn't delivered, it wouldn't have been a hit. You've got to remember that Karloff was in his 40s when he uh, played Frankenstein. I mean, this was a guy whose career was kind of not really going anywhere. I mean, he'd been in some pictures, but, you know, this was a, a big shock that this picture was so successful and that all of a sudden he was a name. Universal had found their new Lon Chaney, a man of a thousand faces, and Universal uh, immediately signed Karloff to a contract, and they put him in The Old Dark House, another James Whale picture, and they have an opening card on the old dark house explaining to the audience that this is the same Karloff who played the monster in Frankenstein just a few months earlier, and that it's a credit to his versatility as an actor that the audience would even be confused that it's the same person. In other words, the publicity machine was already grinding, promoting Karloff as a movie star bigger than life. Yeah, you know, if, if the film was utterly ridiculous, like Fu Manchu, he knew just that right degree of wry tongue-in-cheekness to inject that made it bearable, that made it you know, something you could get away with. It's clearly a performance that he relishes enormously. It's somewhat politically incorrect, but it definitely is a, a, a genuine portrait of sort of, you know, of, of Asiatic evil. And sort of the edge of cruelty he brings to it is, is, is unexpected for, for such a, a genteel actor. You get The Mummy, which is basically a remake of Dracula with the star of Frankenstein. And then I think we've, we, we know what, what it is. And every other studio in Hollywood says, let's start making films like this. <laughs> In his next horror picture for Universal, The Mummy, they even took his first name away, and he became Karloff, just Karloff, or Karloff the Uncanny. He became a, a brand name, you know? He had the good housekeeping seal of approval as a horror star. And that's Universal doing what it does, which is making movie stars. There was Garbo, there was Chaplin, and there was Karloff. I mean, he was billed as Karloff and Karloff the Uncanny. Never saw a mummy like that. Neither I imagine as anyone else. Looks as though he died in some sensationally unpleasant manner. Buried alive. The superlative scene in which he, he returns to life in mummified form, which is surely the most frightening scene in the cinema, probably up to that point, precisely because of the timing and, and more particularly of the pacing. I mean, it really feels like something very, very slowly filling up with, with life after it's been dead. He's all bandaged up in the first scene with that eight hours of makeup, which, by the way, supposedly caused Karloff to collapse on the set because he couldn't get the oxygen. Then later he had the shrivel-faced Art of Bay makeup that had to be melted off every night. And here he is sort of trapped in these incredible makeups. As the New York Times said, here's a man who has to act behind synthetic wrinkles. We Egyptians are not permitted to dig up our ancient dead. Only foreign museums. Yet he comes across as his very fervent, spiritual lover. First time he sees Zita Johan in that film, the, and the camera comes in and you see his eyes, it's staggering, the romanticism that he evokes there. A thousand pardons. I am out at bay. It's very much a kind of imperial revenge f fantasy or paranoia going on there, isn't there? You know, what happens if, if, if they come and get us? 
Instead of us going out and colonizing them, we don't like it when they do it to us. <laughs> A lot of the credit for the success of that picture went to Karloff. The interesting thing about Karloff with that billing of Karloff the Uncanny is that he actually lives up to the hype. A lesser actor would have been crushed under that kind of expectancy. Karloff was very wise in looking for roles that showcased him not only as uh, a horror star, but also as a great character actor. And for example, he did John Ford's The Lost Patrol that was released in 1934, and he played a religious lunatic when it's stark raving mad in the desert. Very juicy role, uh, and it was the kind of role that, that uh, certainly at that time audiences watched and thought, wow, what a great actor. Boris Karloff could have done straight roles probably for the rest of his career. However, I don't think that he would have been a movie star. He was a movie star because he returned to the genre. And I think he returned to the genre because A, he was very grateful to the genre, and B, it gave him great roles. Well, the first Karloff and Lugosi film was The Black Cat, Universal in 1934. And Karloff, of course, was under contract at the time to Universal, and they were looking for a great horror property for him. Lugosi was in New York preparing to do a new play. But the uh, brainstorm erupted to put the two of them together. There's something in horror movies that people love your favorite box of chocolates. You know? They like seeing a movie with, your, with the familiar sets and the familiar actors. And Lugosi's got to do his number, and Karloff's got to do his number. And it, maybe it reassures people. You hear that, Petrus? The phone is dead. Even the phone is dead. The Black Cat is my very favorite film. I think as a pairing, it was inspired. They match each other precisely and brilliantly. You can actually see Karloff taking great delight in being genuinely evil. Hungary's greatest psychiatrist is traveling to meet Austria's greatest architect, who is also a Satanist, some kind of mad scientist who preserves women in his castle. I wanted to have her beauty always. And he's a great concert organist as well. This is great um, deranged chess match being played between these two insane polymaths. Checkmate. You lose, Fetus. You have Karloff playing the modern Lucifer. You have Lugosi playing the avenging angel who skins him alive, and they work together like champions. You must be indulgent of Dr. Verdigast's weakness. He is the unfortunate victim of one of the commoner phobias, but in an extreme form. He has an intense and all-consuming horror of cats. He's very spine-chilling in that. Karloff has already taken over the, the name of Frankenstein, not Frankenstein's monster anymore. Clearly, you know, it'd be too much of a mouthful, I suppose. But nevertheless, you know, the, these two absolutely iconic images are going to be put together in a film. This is being marketed as the appeal of that movie. It was alchemy, really. It was box office magic. They adjusted the uh, billing on the Raven to say Karloff and Lugosi for the only time. But it was still Karloff, the top bill, even though in The Raven, his role was only half as large as Lugosi's. Legends of rivalry between Karloff and Lugosi, and Karloff always spoke very, very respectfully of Lugosi throughout his life and after Lugosi's death. I think Lugosi in those days would have liked to have disliked him, but he couldn't. I think Karloff was simply too charming. I mean, he was funny on the set, and he sang Cockney ditties, and he was you know, a delight, and he had tea breaks. Karloff had a twinkle in his eye. There's something slightly ironic about a lot of Karloff's performances. He's sort of watching himself doing it, and he's not taking himself 100% seriously. They worked together very, very peacefully because of the fact that they were both European gentlemen. I told him to keep his mouth shut. He gets the gag out of his mouth and starts yelling for the police. I have the acetylene torch in my hand. So you put the burning torch into his face, into his eyes. Well, sometimes you can't help things like that. 
When Bride of Frankenstein came along, of course, he was the logical choice to play the monster again, and he jumped at the opportunity, even though he disagreed with James Whale about allowing the monster to speak. The Frankenstein monster, Carlos, was the first monster in the history of the cinema to be brought back to life after he was officially dead. I mean, he established that, that, that precedent, really. I mean, now we're used to them popping up at the end of the movie. This is gonna be the story in which the monster didn't die at the end after all. We only thought he was dead. Carlos seemed to feel a responsibility to the character. He was happy to come back for Bride of Frankenstein, although he, he clashed with Whale over the direction that the, the character was taking. He thought, yeah, it was, it was kind of breaking the frame. You know, it's what animators call off-model. Yeah, having the Frankenstein monster talk. For me, uh, The Bride of Frankenstein is his best performance as the creature. The key scene where Karloff's concerned in The Bride of Frankenstein is with the hermit, the blind hermit in the forest. Where, uh, which is a, trans a direct transcription of a whole chunk of the middle volume of the of the original novel, where 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 the creature learns language and learns all about literature and things by meeting this this family. No, no, this is good. Smoke. You try. Oh. <laughs> Good, good. And it's easy to parody, you know, food, good, smoke, good, you know, and all this. But it's genuinely touching. Blind hermit who is really beginning to enjoy and starting to laugh and enjoy, have a party in the middle of the forest. And this sad, lumbering creature. And they develop, in the space of three minutes, a relationship. It's really, really touching. I think you can get a sense in which they, they pretty well did everything they possibly could do with, with, with the, the speaking monster. Uh, not least, he becomes actually, in some ways, a very blackly comic figure. Oh. oh. I thought I was alone. Good evening, Smog. Friend. Yes, I hope so. Have a cigar. They are my only weakness. There's a great deal of underlying uh, black and wicked wit in, 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 in almost all of Wales' horror movies. If anything, he's playing the pathos even more in the second one, where he becomes Christ at one point. You know, there he is on this extraordinary treeless forest designed by Danny Hall, where, where you've got these upright trees, which, which are like telephone pylons. They don't, they don't have any leaves, they don't have any branches. And uh, Karloff is, is strapped to one of those. So he becomes a sort of Christ figure. How James Whale got that through the censors is, I mean, is one of the great mysteries, I think. The fact that the rest of the film has got more going for it than the performance means that it's perhaps less appreciated. I mean, the whole thing about The Bride of Frankenstein is it's not just got the Frankenstein monster, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's got Elsa Lanchester, uh, it's got uh, Dr. Pretorius, and, and, and lots of yeah, quirky, interesting visual ideas. It's full of things that are great. Um, and the Frankenstein monster is just one part of it. Whereas I, I think you'd have to say in the first film, the Frankenstein monster is 75% of why it's great. We belong dead. By the time he gets to the third one, I mean, Karloff actually said he was worried that it would either become burlesque that if you push this thing any further, it would become musical, or it would become just a prop. But he still has moments of, of pathos with Basil Rathbone when he first sees him and compares their faces in a mirror, and later on with Basil Rathbone's little son when he's deciding whether or not to uh, throw him in the pit of boiling lava. You can see the, the criminal brain warring with his better nature. The monster becomes mute again, um, but he becomes, uh, again, he, he reverts to the tragic figure of the first film. And in a sense, there's, there's no more tragic or heart-rending moment uh, in the series than when a cast monster realizes that his only friend, uh, Igor, is dead. And um, that, that, that's, that's a remarkable moment, and, and perhaps not, not yet fully uh, as anthologized as I'm sure it will be as time goes on. <laughs> All 
the magic of the monster is in that moment. He turned 50 on the set of Son of Frankenstein and thought that he was just too old to do this anymore. Karloff felt that the series cheapened the character. As he said, it was from hunger. They were making movies because the movies would make money, not because they had anything interesting or new to say about the character. The character of the monster is, is on its way to be picture status in that picture because he's basically, and, and Karloff saw this, I mean, he, 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 that's why he didn't do any more of them. He said, look, I'm, I'm becoming a prop. Not following in the series in the 40s for him was certainly the right decision. <laughs> Sharp. It must be Master Maud. He has a neck like leather. Tougher than yours, my rooster. In Tower of London, he has to kill the princes. He's this dreadful um, axe man, the headsman, who goes around killing everybody. And, and he has to murder the princes. And, and there's this great tenderness and sadness with which he sort of carries out the deed. And one can't help but feel sympathy for him. Karloff brought himself to those parts. I wouldn't think necessarily the director said, oh, I want you to show tenderness here, but he would have, as an actor, would have wanted to do that. There's a physical eagerness in his body language. He leans into people, he leans over people, and there's a glint in the eye which is attractive, but it's the glint of something predatory. In the early 40s, very enterprising producers talked Boris Karloff into appearing in their comedy on Broadway, Arsenic and Old Lace. And the part was specifically written for Boris Karloff. He didn't want to do it. He felt he was unworthy to be an actor on Broadway, which is remarkable to think about. Arsenic and Old Lace showed that he was uh, a terrific actor and that he also was a good sport, certainly, to take that joking in it. So it made him very, very wealthy. Arsenic and Old Lace was one of the most successful plays in the history of the American theater. And Carlos stayed in it for three years. I was uh, right, uh, doing interviews of actors for British film fan magazines, and I was able to get an interview with Karloff. Uh, we hit it off quite well together, because I suppose partly also because of my English background. And one day he handed me a story, which at the time was called Stranglehold, which had been written for him specifically. He had agreed to do the film for me. And we changed the title to The Haunted Strangler, or in England it was called Grip of the Strangler. And uh, we made the film, and it was so successful that uh, Karloff agreed to do another film with me, which was called Corridors of Blood. Karloff seems, for a major star, to have been singularly without ego, and very much saw himself, I think all the way through his life, as a kind of jobbing actor who got a lucky break. Universal Films and others, they were a good gig while they lasted, but that's an actor's life. After Austin and Old Lace, Boris Karloff came back to Hollywood. He signed a two-picture contract with Universal. He did the climax, in which he played a hypnotist, and he did the rowdy House of Frankenstein, in which he resurrected all of the big universal monsters, Lon Chaney's Wolfman, John Carradine's Dracula, Glenn Strange's Frankenstein monster. All the protection of a traveling show. I as Lampini, you as my assistant. Free to move on towards those for whom I have unloving memories. I think Karloff came back to the horror film after Austin and Old Lace because it was what the audiences wanted to see him do. And he always said that you were a very lucky actor if audiences showed a preference for what they wanted to see you do. 15,000 marks. A thousand for every year that I spent in a stinking, slimy dungeon. You bargain poorly, Herr Ullman. Don't kill me. Don't kill me. Don't kill my trusted old assistant. Why, no. I'm going to repay you for betraying me. He often made very wise career choices within the genre, finding himself in the 40s working for Val Luton in a style completely different than the horror films he'd made for Universal was a brilliant move. The Body Snatcher, which many people believe is his greatest performance, his masterpiece performance, and a performance that really, I think, was fully deserving of an Academy Award. In fact, he said that Val Luton was the man who rescued him from the living dead and restored his soul. He had that much respect 
for Luton. The horror rolls but there's you know, a whole wealth of feeling and breadth in them. One of the truly mesmerizing villains in Hollywood history in that film. One thing we rather underrate Karloff for was, was his business savvy. Um, not just in the types of film roles he took, but in recognizing that movies weren't the only thing. He always kept a really solid presence in radio because he had that great voice. He could do a wide range of things. He did like children's stuff on the radio as well as, as, uh, as scary stuff. And in the 50s, when horror films disappear, he has a couple of years where he just goes and makes television programs. He used his career very wisely. He knew what he was doing. He got into television very early, which I think was a very clever move. His first TV series in the 1940s, when television was still in its infancy. And he wasn't one of those actors who said, I'm going to stay away from television, it's going to destroy the movies. He said, let me embrace this medium and see what I can do. And because of that, we got series like The Veil and especially Thriller, which are, you know, incredibly good horror TV series. And I'm, I'm delighted that Karloff put his stamp on, on those shows. And he wasn't afraid of working in television or radio for that matter. He embraced the new technology and he used it to the best of its advantage. And so again, a whole new generation grew up in the 1950s and 60s, knowing him only as a television star. When you look at the, the resumes of these guys, I mean, they did a lot of stuff in their lives. I mean, more stuff than a lot of people can do now because there was just some, the, the media outlets were different then. But Karloff always had the better uh, material, I think. And, and he could jump from picture like The Strange Door or, you know, something, some pot boiler kind of a movie. And then, uh, you know, in the same decade do, uh, you know, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. So television being then much more like the stage because it was live and the three camera system gave Karloff a great deal of, of um, freedom and scope, which I think allowed him then to go back into the horror realm with his pride intact, if you like. He wasn't simply being typecast in horror pictures. Karloff's impact on the horror genre is impacted by the fact that he became a sort of a folk hero uh, in the 60s to kids uh, because of their interest in Frankenstein and the fact that he was able to parlay that into uh, a very visible hosting job on Thriller, which was an extremely popular show with kids. Of course, he worked very well on that show, both as the host and also as the guest star in several episodes. Karloff really became one of the most versatile character actors in the world, and a character actor who was able to jump from one medium to the other with incredible ease. Yeah, he saw that in order to, as it were, stay current with the audience, he needed to keep up with it. He had a sense that he could always rely on an audience's affection to get him work. Karloff got mileage that I don't think any other horror actor ever was able to achieve. He worked with everybody who was notable in the genre. He did those wonderfully high-spirited comedies with Roger Corman. He did The Raven and the Comedy of Terrors. Uh, he was able to work with Mario Bava in Black Sabbath. He was able to um, even go on a show like Shindig and sing the Peppermint Twist while go-go girls danced around him in ghoulish outfits. I mean, he did it all. To me, uh, he is the voice of Dr. Seuss, isn't it? I mean, Jim Carrey didn't come close. He virtually kind of, if not entirely summing up 50 years of the horror movie, uh, he's certainly central to an enormous amount of it. Boris Karloff was allowed um, a very graceful swan song in the horror genre in Peter Bogdanovich's Targets. Again, a role that was designed for him, written for him, and a movie that would not have been made without him. It was, first and foremost, a Boris Karloff movie. He plays an elderly horror actor who reminisces about working in the criminal code for Howard Hawks and tells stories uh, beautifully, um, as if he's everyone's great granddad, telling stories of the oral tradition of Hollywood of old. And this wonderful moment at the end where the serial killer is standing there, and there's the terror on the screen. And there's Karloff, this old man, who actually has difficulty walking by that stage. He was very bow-legged, stumbles towards him, and the sort of can't work out uh, on the screen or the real actor. And in that confusion, they capture him. It made a statement about both the horror genre and the horror of modern life by juxtaposing them. I think there are moments in Targets where you see something that's very close to the real Boris Karloff, although um, I also think that he, he devoted quite a lot of time to concealing the real Boris Karloff. It's possibly the single greatest tribute to an actor who appears within that, that very film. It's not actually his last film, but let's pretend it is.
You know, I mean, let's pretend he didn't go and make those quickies in Mexico afterwards. Yeah, because it's, it is a farewell performance. Boris Karloff, because he maneuvered around in the genre so much, was the one star who ended up working with most of the other horror stars in every period. I am not afraid of you. I needed more evidence for the police. I got it tonight when I followed you here from the dressing room. In time to save this child. You killed Marceline. You will never say that again. There's a through line of Boris Karloffness from my very first performance to my very last. This particular piece of celluloid nonsense I'm in right now doesn't matter as much as my truth and allegiance to the Karloffness of Karloff. I'd like you to have my notes and records. Of all the newspapers, yours was the only one which was fair to me. I think one of the great strengths of Karloff as an actor is he, he was able to bring much more, even to the, most, the, the smallest roles he played or the most underwritten roles he played. He could always bring something to them to make them a little bit different and a little bit more interesting and keep you watching. He was a, you know, a broad, solid, decent character player who could more or less do what he wanted. I think he was best in his horror roles. The macabre does seem to have brought out absolutely his finest work. Can't knock Frankenstein. I mean, it is quite an amazing performance. I mean, it could, it's something that could have been a stunt, and instead it turned out to be something indelible. You know, it's, you know, you gotta hand it to him. I'm convinced that Karloff is, in fact, one of the most able actors in the history of cinema. He's often overlooked as such because of his association so strongly with, particularly with one part, but with one genre, with horror. He's left us a legacy of great performances in the horror genre, probably a legacy that will not be matched by anyone. He said with, with great sincerity that if he ever gave up acting, he'd be dead in a few months. He couldn't live without it. It was really his passion. He starts out as William Henry Pratt, and that over his career, he invents this, this Boris Karloff, who is the, this strange image of the, the genteel but slightly sinister Englishman. Like many great stars, his greatest performance is himself. Thank you.